Well, we're in this series called Faith. And faith is such an important topic to the Christian life and to life in general, this idea of, of faith that drives our decisions, faith that shapes our mindset, faith that moves us into, into action. And what is faith? We've defined the word faith with this phrase, confidence that God will do it. Biblical faith is, is an inward agreement. It's an inward confidence that God has the ability, the power, the capacity, the goodness, the presence to do it. You say, what's it? I'm not sure what it is. It's what you got faith for. What do you believe in God for? But I'm just, I'm asking him over these 21 days to just continue to stir our faith, continue to move our faith, continue to deepen our faith, um, our confidence in him. And so what we've been doing is looking at stories in the Bible of people that had an essence of faith and their story was documented in such a way that we can learn from it today. So I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. If you need a Bible, I want to invite you to uh, put your hand in the air. We'll walk you one down or we have one on the screen for you. And we're going to read 12 verses of Scripture, a story that for some of you might be familiar. For others of you, it might be um, brand new. And my prayer is that God would give you something out of this Scripture that, uh, that you can apply on Monday and on Tuesday and for the next season that we have uh, by faith. So if you're ready, say ready. ready. If you're hungry, say let's eat. eat. Let's eat. Let's eat. Father, we're, we got some energy in this room today. I love it. I love it, God. Uh, we're, we're ready to eat. We're hungry. Um, God, we, may we never get more excited about a sporting event than we do about knowing you and, and, and hearing from you and, and watching you and encountering you, Lord. So Holy Spirit, we do. God, we do ask with faith. Come on, just pray that with me. Just say, Lord, speak to me. Lord, speak, to me. speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, here's what I want to invite you to do. I need some crowd participation for this sermon. Uh, whenever we approach the word they or there, I want you to shout it out with me, all right? Yeah. So when we, when we come across like this word there, they or uh, there. When I get there, I just want you to just shout it out. Scare the person next to you. Now, don't scare them, but, uh, but let's go ahead and do it together. Okay, ready? Let's read it. It says, and when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. He was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Yeah. Yeah. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. This is the word of the Lord. My, my prayer is that we would have moments like that yes. where we say, God, I've never seen anything like this before. Yes. Yes. I, I, I want to see something like yes. that, but, but this is my moment to do that. Um, I want to preach a message to you by the subject titled, The Faith of They. The Faith oh, of They. For my note takers in the room, uh, feel free to jot that down. The Faith 
of they. Last week we talked about the faith of this, this blind beggar named Bartimaeus who didn't stay a blind beggar. He became a faithful follower. He moved from that side of the road to putting his faith in Jesus, to having eyes that see, and he began to follow Jesus and bring him glory. Uh, today we're looking at the faith, the faith of they, the faith of they. One thing that I love to do when I, when I read the Bible is I try to put myself into the story. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, I, I don't want to just drive by the scriptures and be like, hey, Jesus, that was awesome. All right, on to the next story. Because I think in doing so, you, you don't fully feel it. And the Bible is a living and active book. The, the Bible was not meant to just be driven by, but the Bible was meant to, to soak into. The Bible was meant to, to come alive and, and you can find yourself even in the stories and see Jesus move in supernatural ways. And, you know, I like to, I like to go into the room by faith and just kind of be a fly on the wall and watch Jesus move. And I want to see Bartimaeus on the road. And I want to, I want to look at the texture of hair and I want to try to imagine the moment. Come on. Amen. Yeah. That's what I want us to do here. I want us to use our, our faith. And I want to try to go inside this story. Now, what had just happened in, in Mark chapter one, right? First off, the gospel writer, Mark, uh, he is a little bit unique compared to Matthew, Luke, and John. In fact, all four Gospels have their own uh, uniqueness to them. What's neat about Mark is that Mark is kind of like the jam-packed action Gospel of Jesus, where all the other Gospels have 20 plus chapters. Mark has 16 because he's like, I'm gonna get right to it. This is what Jesus was doing. Mark chapter one is loaded with content, so much so that Jesus heals somebody and because the individual didn't listen to the words of Jesus, basically Jesus said, keep it on the low for a moment. But he couldn't contain it. He went out and told everybody. Can't really be mad at him for that. But what happened is Jesus couldn't enter the towns anymore. So he was in a desolate place. And finally, he decides to go back into the public eye. And when he returned, verse 1 of chapter 2, he came to Capernaum. And it was reported that he was at home. He had ventured to somebody's house. We don't know what it means when it says Jesus was home. Um, he would stay in different places. In fact, Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the son of man, you, you don't know where he's going to lay his head tonight. Uh, Jesus here enters into somebody's home and there they are in verse two. Um, let's look at the setting. Can, I, can, we, can we just catch the setting? Let's put ourselves into uh, the room, Mark chapter 2, uh, verse 2. It says, many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. As I read this verse, I, I thought, here's what I'm seeing. This is a setting where faith can grow. If you're a note taker, I just want you to catch that. What I notice about just the onset setting, this is a setting, this is an environment where faith can grow. Over the past few weeks, I was I was preaching on the power of seeds, like Jesus refers to the kingdom of God, and he illustrates that with a mustard seed. But what we learned about mustard seeds is mustard seeds can only grow to the level of environment that it's around. So if a mustard seed is not planted in the right space, it'll never grow to its fullest potential. Same with the Christian. This is an environment where faith has the absolute potential to grow. Why? Let me show it to you again in verse, verse 2. Here's what it shows us. Many were gathered together. Ooh, I love that. Yeah, yeah. This wasn't just a, me and Jesus going on a date party, although I'm for that too. Yeah. I think that we should have a lone, private, intimate, personal relationship with the Father. Yeah. We should spend time with God in His Word. We should spend time with God in prayer, and we, we, ha we need that abiding. Yeah. But not, not at the expense where we don't see each other. This is a moment where the believers gathered together. This is church. This is church. This is small group. How many people were there? Well, so many people were there that there was no more room. Well, what about, what about, what about at the door? No, nope, not even at the door. So put yourself in, come on, be a sardine. Be, yo, get off me, bro. Like you on my shoulder, right? It's a little muggy in here right now. We're getting the fans out. Come on, right? I like it. There's no more room. 
even some of you right now are getting uncomfortable just with the thought that you could be in there. (laughs) But this is the place where faith grows. Not only were people gathered together, which I think is so valuable, but Jesus is there because Jesus is around the body. Jesus is around the togetherness here. And what's he doing, friends? He's preaching. What is he preaching? He's preaching the word. I think Jesus models the best form of Bible teaching. And that's preach the word. I mean, I think that the best form of preaching, like there's this moment where the apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthians, I believe. And he says, he says, I've heard that some of you are preaching yourself. And then Paul says, preach myself, question mark. May it never be, right? Jesus preaching the word. Jesus is unfolding the word and the word of God is living and active and true. And when I just, I just want to tell you, when we gather together and the word of God is present, that's where growth happens. That's where our faith can grow. And that's why I want to even use this as a moment to just say, don't make church an option. Make it the priority. Schedule around it. Don't make going to a group an option. Make it the priority. Here's what I've learned along the journey of my faith. When you stop going, you stop growing. When you say, you know what, I'm going to make it an option. I've I've actually heard this testimony from people. People, Over the years, I've heard it so many times. Man, Pastor Hyde, 2018, that was my year. I was growing. I was killing it. And then I stopped going. (laughs) And I stopped growing. Man, when I used to go to group every week and I used to go to prayer meetings on Wednesday nights and I used to be there on Sunday, sometimes I hit both services. I would, I would serve one, I'd attend one. I, man, I was growing. But then I stopped going. And I just want to encourage you, this right here, this is the type of setting where growth happens. Lord, put me in that setting. I want to be a part of that. Um, I love this verse in Romans chapter 10 where Paul writes to the Romans and he gives us the spiritual principle. He says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. How does faith come? You got to open your ears up. Jesus oftentimes would speak and he he would start by saying, hey, if you got ears, hear. This is where faith grows. Uh, If you didn't hear it from him, it's not faith. If you say, hey, today I'm just moving by faith, but you don't got a word. You might be moving in your own word. You might be moving in your own strength. Faith comes from hearing. So I wouldn't move upon my own emotions and feelings until I hear from him. That's why it's important to be in the word. That's why it's important to go to church. That's why it's important to go to a group. That's why it's important to hear his voice. Amen. Come on. I love this right here. This is an environment where faith uh, can grow. Let me give you the second point of the sermon here today. I think, it's, I think it's very valuable to catch this principle. This was a small group filled with faith. This is a small group that we see a, an essence of faith that is contagious. Faith that's, at least for me, is stirring. Look at verse 3 with me. Verse 3, it says, And they came, oh, I'm sorry, let's do it again. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Now, oh, church family, would you help me and turn your imagination on for a second? I'm trying to picture this moment. They, described as four men, they came bringing a paralyzed individual. If this were a show, this were a movie, Imagine one of those shows that's like this one scene has like the house and there's Jesus and he's unfolding and preaching the word. And it is so jam packed that people can't even get in the door. And then maybe it's like into a different scene and you see these four guys. Can you picture them? And what are they doing? They got, they got an individual, let's just say an older man. We don't know how old the individual was, but let's just say that it's, it's a teenager. Maybe it's an adult. And this individual is laying down on some type of bed. And here is this small group, four. 
Five. This is the starting five. Four and a paralyzed man. Walk down the street. And they're on their way to King Jesus. Here's what I wrote down in my notes. Lord, get me some friends like that. I, I, need, I need to find some people that will carry me to Jesus when I don't feel like it. We don't know much about the paralytic. It doesn't give us a ton of commentary into this individual and how this person responded. This is just Hyden speculating of what this could have been. This paralyzed person could have been like, put me down. I did not agree to this. I did not sign up for you to carry me on this bed all the way up to where Jesus is. This is kind of annoying and kind of weird and it's kind of painful. And why are y'all doing this? I was cool with it halfway. Now we're getting close. And they said, hey, we're going to bring our friend to Jesus. We have faith for our friend. He may have stopped believing. We're going to believe for him. I'm going to bring somebody who has a need to Jesus. I love all of the different stories that I've heard of people who, who found somebody that was in need. Listen, don't just speak to people for random sake. Speak to people's needs. Here's why I want to invite you to church. Here's why I want to invite you to Jesus. He's got what you need. The Samaritan woman was thirsty. She was on her fifth marriage. She was trying to figure out how to find value in codependent relationships. And finally, Jesus said, that's not what you need. You need living water. And what did she do? She went back to her hometown and she brought everybody to Jesus. How about God can use anybody? Amen. God can use you. He used four men who had faith to bring their paralyzed friend to Jesus. One of the reasons why I love small group, we call them charge groups, is because it's in the charge group that you get around a smaller amount of people that you can do life with in such a way that that they could be the voice that could help you get back to Jesus. Find this paralyzed man. We don't, we don't quite know what's happening here, but I love that they demonstrated faith. Like this pastor Hyden, I don't always get it right on this. I, I still am asking the Lord to grow my level of compassion, grow my level of love. I, I might be like, if I got a message on my watch and it was like, yo, Jesus is at this house. And he's preaching the word. You better get here. I might look at my paralyzed friend and be like, hey, you chill out. Here's the remote. Here's like a DoorDash phone number. I'm going to go see Jesus. I'll let you know. I'll, I'll even, I'll FaceTime you. But I love these four say, no, no, you coming, bro. And he goes, no, I'm going to slow you down. You won't make it on time. It's going to be hard. Like I'm heavy. We don't have a bed. He goes, take, you just, we're going to take the whole bed. Right. <laughs> what? Yeah. Give me that type of circle. Yeah. Now you today might say, hey, Pastor Hyden, honestly, I don't have those type of friends in my life. And I would say, I understand. But why don't you start by being that friend? Yeah. Right. If you turn it around yeah. and you say, hey, I don't have it, but I'm going to be it. Yeah. I'm going to be that person for somebody yeah. this semester. From September to December of 2023, I'm going to be that friend. And you just start to ask, what does that look like for me? The third thing I see as I study this passage is I I see a radical demonstration of faith. The faith that's demonstrated in this text is mind-blowing. I mean, faith is on display here in a way that I just, Lord, whoa. Whoa. Look at verse four with me. I want you to try to imagine this. Come on, help me out with the days. And when they could not get near because of the crowd, they left and went to Chick-fil-A. Oh, my bad. We are on the wrong translation. When they could not get near him because of the crowd. All right, so let's envision it. Excuse me, excuse me. me. We ain't getting in. Jesus is like on his third point. The house is completely packed. We can't even get into the door. What are we going to do? Let's take the roof off. (laughs) What? Is this a real story? 
they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. This is an incredible passage. I've, I've been studying just some of the, the house structures in this culture of this time. Most of the houses were one story. They would have a ladder on the side of the house that went up and then kind of let you off onto the top of the house. And on the roof, there was this kind of harder foundation where you could even sit up there. You could have a meeting up there. You could watch the sunset. That was some of the culture on how things went. There was a first a, a layer of like sticks and what was called thatch that would be laid across the top level of the roof. And on top of the thatch, they would then put this wet mud that they would patch up all of the roof. And then they would let that mud dry. And then at some point they would, depending on the level of economy and the financial structure of the home, they would get tiles and just begin tiling the roof. In fact, the gospel of Luke's account of this same story says that the individual started to take off the tiles. Some of y'all are like, not at my house. They started to take off the tiles. They removed the roof and made an opening. Brothers and sisters, this wasn't no little hole. Like, how did they lower him? Like, I don't think they were like, we're going to just drop you down here, bro. I think that they had to make a big enough opening where they could actually bring down a bed. Like some type of stretcher object where all four are now lowering this individual. Like as a communicator, as a preacher, one thing that I struggle with at times is distraction, right? That's why we love to have an undistracted environment, right? Where, where we want to lean into the, to the word. We want to create a space for focus because I can be that squirrel guy real quick. This moment right here, I think even Jesus had to be distracted. Like, imagine if you're like sitting there and you're like got your notes and you're like all focused, you got your coffee. And then there's like some like, like little like dust coming from the top. Like I know it was raining. I know there was like a leak, but like, I feel like that was like some rubble. Did you feel that? I, f I think that was, something just hit me. Something just hit me. I don't know. Anyways, keep focused. All of a sudden there's like a light that comes through. There's some sunlight. And there's these cats that are working on the roof and they opening it up. And I wonder if the paralyzed man is saying, I'm sorry, guys, I didn't want him to do it. I didn't ask for this. I know that Jesus, Jesus, I don't know what's going on right now. They lowering him down and then poof, right there. They lowered him right in front of Christ. I love the, the, the faith of they. The faith of they, we just got to get them there and we just got to get them down and we got to do whatever it takes to get our friend to Jesus. Amen. We're going to get him there. We're going to, we're going to carry him there by faith. Now what happens next, I think is really interesting. My, la my, my fourth point that I want us to just identify with is this, Jesus sees it all. Let me actually just take a moment and I just want to talk to the room. I want to talk online. Help me, help me just for a moment. Let me just see your eyes for a second. Hear me. Hear me walk church. I just want to remind you that Jesus sees you. He sees your faith. He sees your work. He sees your effort. The prayers that you're praying privately, he sees them. He sees you driving. He sees you maneuvering. He sees you in your worship with him. He sees your sin. He sees your struggle. I just want you to know that he, he sees it all. This next text is a good reminder that our Lord sees. One of my favorite names for God is the God of Elroy, the God who sees. The God who even saw a, a lady named Hagar in the book of Genesis on her thirsty, even feeling like a death season for her and her son called out upon the Lord and gave him the name. You are the God who sees me. The same God who sees in Genesis is the same God who sees in Mark. Look at Mark chapter two. Look at this verse with me. Verse four and verse five. When Jesus saw, come on, say it with me. 
I would imagine that it would say when Jesus saw the paralytic's faith. When Jesus saw the man on the stretcher. I mean, the reason why I'm implying it wasn't necessarily him driving this is because when Jesus saw their faith. When Jesus saw the faith of the four. He looked at the paralytic. Can you, I just see Jesus go like this. I wonder if the owner of the house is like, dang it, come on. What? I just built this house. Come on. Who knows what's going on right now? Some people are trying to dust themselves off. Some people are mad at the paralytic. Some people are trying to figure out what just happened here. L- listen to me, walk church. Listen to me. Jesus saw their faith. And he said, you guys got so much faith. You're so confident that if I could just get him here, he'd be healed. If I could just get him to Jesus, something would happen. Jesus looks at the paralyzed man and what's the first word he says? Son. That's a whole sermon in itself right there. Whoa. Jesus says son. What a word. He does not say sinner. He does not say paralyzed man. He says your sin is not going to be your identity. Your circumstance isn't going to be your identity. You're a son. Your sins are forgiven. I can't think of a better phrase to hear from Jesus than child, son, daughter. I can't think of a better word from the Lord than to hear this. Your sins wiped away. Gone. Forgiven. Nothing better than feeling forgiven. Here's what I want you to do. In Christ, I, I just want to paint this picture for you for a moment. What if that Jesus, what if this Yeshua walked into this middle school cafeteria and walked right up to you right now and put his hand right on your head and he said, son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. Yes. Wouldn't that be encouraging? Listen, friend, that's what we believe. Yes. That's what he has done for us. Yes. That is the good news that we hold on to and stand. I hope you don't come in here thinking, I better do enough good stuff to hear that. You have that by faith. Your faith alone is what Jesus has identified with, that you believe that in him you are forgiven by his blood and his cross and his righteousness. In a moment, we're going to open up these communion tables on the left and right side and in the back. When you approach this cup and when you open it up and you eat this little wafer, remember his body broken for your sins. Remember his blood. This juice represents the forgiveness found in the blood. Amen. Hear his voice say to you, son, your sins are forgiven. Daughter, your sins, you know those things that you don't want anybody to know about? You know that you did the thing that you said you wouldn't do again? You know your argument with the person that you said you weren't going to argue? You know you watched the thing? You know all that? You're forgiven. Not by what you've done, but what I did on the cross at Calvary for your glory. Jesus has done it. And so today I want to encourage you to just be free into into his forgiveness again. How about Jesus knew more than physical healing, he needed spiritual healing. More than just having his legs and his arms strengthened. What he needed was to be forgiven. I heard this quote recently. uh, It it came from um, a psychologist who said, most people that I deal with really are not struggling with mental illness. They're just struggling with self-guilt. And they're just not able to get over the fact of what happened or what they've done. And what they really just need is to hear, son, your sins are forgiven. Daughter, your your sins are gone. So you don't have to continue to live in what you've done, but you do need to live in what he's done. And this is what the communion packet helps us remember, amen? What he's done. How does this story conclude? Well, I think that it's also really neat that people ask this question. There's a murmuring in the house and there's all types of different vantage points. One is from the paralytic. 
who's forgiven. Another is from the friends who brought him there and they're exhausted. And another is uh, from the people that are, and then there's the scribes. The scribes are taking notes and they're saying, wait, he can't forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. What's Jesus doing here? He's giving them a sneak peek of his divinity. He's letting them know right in that moment, I am who I am. In fact, you're right. Jesus is in agreement. You're right. Only God himself can forgive sins. He asked them a question. He said, what's harder to say? Son, your sins are forgiven or pick up your bed and walk. Really, the harder statement to say actually is son, your sins are forgiven because only one person can say that. If you get that wrong, that's dangerous. You you couldn't just say that. This is the most startling statement to say. And Jesus says, I'm big enough to say it. I'm I'm God enough. Jesus says, I am the the virgin born Messiah who came down from heaven. When you see the father at work, when when you see me at work, you see the father at work. Before Abraham was, I am, Jesus says. He says, I do have the authority to forgive sins. And Jesus says, because I know what I came here to do. I came here to die for this paralyzed man, and I will do it. And he has the authority to forgive him. But, come on, how about God being even even better, right? He says, but just so that you guys can be aware, I got the power as well. (laughs) Son, pick up your bed and walk. And go home. And go home a healed, forgiven, free man. Amen? Amen. And everybody in the room, like I think of it like, you know, one of those college football game locker rooms yesterday where they, they got the, the Martinelli's apple juice. Okay, we'll say that spraying everywhere. And it's just a pandemonium in that house. Because not only, you know, the, the, the limited mind would say, yeah, it's easier to say, son, your sins are forgiven. We don't know if it's true or not. Let's see you do something really about it. And Jesus goes, man, I can do that too. Just so you can know his sins are forgiven. Just so you can know I I mean what I say. Watch me do this as well. A boom shakalaka. I love that. Amen. Jesus can do that too. Hey, uh, the worship team is going to help me close. Um, I have one last observation. Can I give you my last observation? Because I've, I've, I love this passage. I've loved this passage. It's been one of my favorite faith stories that's always moved me because it's essence on community. Uh, but this time around, God opened my eyes to see something I never saw before. I want to share the revelation with you. Just straight from his word. My fifth observation is this. Praise God for the owner of the house. This started because somebody said, You can come to my house. And Jesus said, that's where we'll go. Maybe you've heard this before. Hear it again. God is not looking for your ability. He's looking for your availability. If you think your ability is impressing God, it's not. In fact, your ability is actually just another reason to give him the glory. He gave it to you. Um, He's looking for somebody who says, hey, I'm available. Use me. I love how this individual said, Lord, use my house. I don't know what's going to happen. It might not be the cleanest. It might not be the biggest. But use my house. Jesus, come in. And next thing you know, the whole house is full. The owner of this house probably didn't know everybody. He's probably like looking around. It's probably a couple that's like, wait. Don't go up there. Wait, don't go up. Dang. And next thing you know, the roof the roof, the roof is gone. <laughs> Two questions. Can I give you some reflection thought? Yes. Two questions of reflection. reflection. Reflect on this. Help me, help me, help me. How did the owner of this house feel in the short term? Honestly, come on. How did the owner of the house feel in the short term? Angry. Angry. He was mad. In one of the servers, somebody said, get out. Somebody said insurance. Somebody said, y'all need to fix it. Somebody said, big mad, hot, frustrated. I've heard every single word of those. 
Now, let me ask you this question. How did the owner of the house feel in the long term? Praising God. Glorifying God. What else? What else? Blessed. Grateful. Honored. Glad he did. Favored. Hey, for the rest of his life, he got to say, that was my house. Hey, have you ever heard the story about the paralyzed dude? Who he, he, now, he now works at 24-Hour Fitness. Yeah, that guy. You know, you know his story? That was my house. In fact, it was my, it was my roof. That, I bet you this person got like a snapshot Polaroid photo, framed it of just that day. That was at my house. And you know, my feeling moved from angry, frustrated, how dare they, to a prayer. Yes. Can I give you the prayer? I wrote this prayer down. I want to give you the prayer. This is Hayden's prayer. I'll put it up on the screen. God, use my house. God, use my house. God, the thing that you gave me, and I know it's deep, and I know it's intimate, and I know it's private, but God, would you use my house too? God, I want to, in the long term, be able to look back and say, God used my house. I didn't just have one of those like rubber zipper clear things over the couch. I couldn't help it. It got dirty. A little kid dumped an apple juice. But God used my house. And in the long term, I'm glad he did. Somebody, Somebody brought their friend to my house. Somebody experienced freedom at my house. I got to be a part of the story. Amen. Now, I know that might rub you a little bit uncomfortable, but maybe that's where you grow. Yes. Let's pray. Father, I just want to say thank you uh, for this sermon. God, I, th- I thank you for, for moving, for speaking, for this story, God, this model, this model of the faith of they. God, we need some friends like that. Help me, Lord. Today, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, and you need to hear him say, Son, your sins are forgiven, call upon his name and you'll be forgiven. Just right now, acknowledge him by faith. Just right now, say, Jesus, I believe. I'm a sinner. But I believe. I'm saved. I'm no longer who I was. I'm made new in you. Thank you, Lord. Just tell him, I I, I turn away from my sins. And I turn with faith to you. God, use me. Use my space. Use my house. Use my hands. Love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Won't he do it? Amen.